Hey everybody, <clears throat> here to talk today about nationalism in Europe and why nationalism is such an, an important part of world history. So the essential questions that we're going to look at today is discuss each of the elements of nationalism and use an example from history to prove that nationalism, nationalism has the potential to unite or tear a country apart. So that is the main focus of today. Okay, so the first question is, what is nationalism? All right. I think too often people tend to um, think of the real simple answer and say that nationalism is simply devotion to one's nation. It's like patriotism. Okay, uh, and that's definitely true. But the more, probably the more important part of nationalism is that nationalism is also pride in one's ethnic group, and historically uh, that has been a very very important thing. Um, you know, when you look at the causes of World War One. Um, you know, nationalism is one of the sparks that starts the war because of uh, a Serbian who doesn't like the Austrians and assassinates their prince. And so we can't forget the ethnic group part of this, okay? Uh, so nationalism is a very important thing. It has the ability of uniting a nation, but it also has the ability to tear a nation apart, okay? Now there are five elements of nationalism, okay? Five things. And if you have them, you will unite as a nation. If you do not have them, you will be torn apart. And those five things are a culture, a history, religion, language, and territory. If a nation can share those things, uh, it is very likely that they will unite. Uh, and if they don't, it is very likely that they will be torn apart or ripped apart, and the country will not be very successful. So when you look at this country, it's, it's kind of cool to ask ourselves, you know, does this nation... Um, do we share the same culture? And I think we do. You, when you look at the United States, I would say that we are a somewhat united nation. Clearly, we have differences of opinion sometimes, uh, and, and there are moments where um, you know it doesn't feel like we're very united people, but I think really we are. Uh, we share a lot of the same culture, whether it's movies, whether it's sports. Um, you know, Wisconsin, you know, where I live and you live, um, you know, early spring, it's time for brats, time for brewers, um, you know, to people that live in Wisconsin, um, this would be considered a normal thing. Um, whereas uh, people around the world or people in other parts of the country be like, wow, those people are just freaking weird. Um, but to us, it's completely normal. All right. So I think that we do share the same culture. Okay. And if you live in southeastern Wisconsin, uh, you know, it's brewers and, and, and brats and, and the sausage race and, in April and May. I mean, that's kind of part of our culture, tailgating. I mean, that's, that's what people in Wisconsin do. And I think that's kind of a unifying force uh, for us Wisconsinites is that we kind of enjoy doing the same thing. In the summer, it's Summerfest. You know, in early spring, it's, you know, it's brewers and brats, you know, and in the fall, it's usually the Packers or something like that. So, you know, it's that culture kind of unites us as a people. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, we also have a, a shared history. So here's some pictures of me with my wife on our honeymoon uh, in D.C. Uh, we actually flew to Aruba out of out of DC, so I don't think too much of a loser of me. Uh, but I think in this country, we, we our our history definitely pulls us together. And I and I think one of the really interesting things about um, Americans and their history is that people associate themselves with our history. Uh, for instance, my my mother's side, uh, they're all Germans. They're German Americans, and they're very patriotic people. Uh, they talk about our country's history with a lot of pride. Uh, but the ironic thing is, is that my uh, my mother's family, uh, you know, got to this country in uh, you know, 1900 or so. But yet they they think about the Civil War, okay, or they talk about the Revolutionary War with pride, like it's part of their history. And so one of the cool things about Americans is that we kind of adopt the history of this nation, even if some of our ancestors weren't there. But it's our history that unites us. Okay, we look back with pride at some of the things that we've accomplished. For instance, this, you know, a very iconic picture from 9-11. Uh, history can unite a people, and if people have a shared history, uh, it can unite them. All right? Uh, shared religion. Okay? Uh, people that share the same religion uh, are often united by that. People that don't share the same religion uh, can tend to not be united and can have more conflicts with each other. Okay? Uh, and language. Um, you know, imagine if this country was, uh, had five or six different languages. So if you look at the map here, I've had a little fun with it. 
Uh, but imagine if, like, the West Coast was Chinese-speaking, and, you know, Southern United States was uh, Spanish-speaking, and, you know, the Great Plains was German-speaking, and the Northeast was English-speaking, and then the, the Great North was, uh, you know, a form of English known as Euperism. Um, you know, with, with all those different languages, it would be really hard for people to interact and, and feel, you know, like they're part of something. Uh, it would make them be more fragmented if there's all these different languages. So I think language can definitely unite a people. And I think that's one of the reasons why, when you look at this country, I think a lot of people feel threatened when people come to this country and don't speak the language. Um, you know, for instance, a lot of people don't like hearing people speak Spanish. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Latino immigrants that come to this country. Um, you know, and it takes a while for people to assimilate um, you know, and, and, and learn the language and stuff like that. But a lot of people feel very threatened um, about the fact there's so much Spanish going, uh, going on in this country, whether it's a toy that has English and Spanish settings or whether you call a 1-800 number and you got to press 1 for English or whatever. Uh, I think a lot of people feel threatened by that because they feel like, you know, language is part of uh, the heritage of this nation and they want to see people kind of adopt that heritage. Um, so you can see nationalism alive and well when it comes to language and stuff like that. So anyways, here's some uh, political cartoons that kind of talk about um, the whole language debate. The language debate you know, was a much bigger deal four or five years ago, uh, back in 08 and 09 and stuff like that. So these are just kind of commentaries on um, you know, language and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing uh, that really unites the people is having a homeland, uh, is having a, an idea of uh, you know, these borders are my home and I will protect that home. Uh, you know, in the, in the attacks on 9-11, um, you know, New York was attacked, but all of America felt like they were attacked, and I think that's a great example of, of nationalism in action. So I have a bunch of pictures here that kind of just show some of the, uh, the patriotic feelings that people in this nation have. A lot of this are kind of like post-9-11 pictures and stuff. Uh, there's a picture of my house. Um, you know, we always, before sports games, we always see um, flags and stuff. Ironically enough, I'm guessing a lot of you look at this picture of this flag and say, wow, that one's pretty small. Um, you know, we see the Pledge of Allegiance every day, uh, which is meant to kind of show you, obviously, love your country and would do anything for it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have Mount Rushmore, it's a great patriotic um, thing to go look at. Um, we have flyovers at sporting events where, you know, these jet planes fly right over and stuff, which is always a lot of fun. Um, you know, when the Olympics come around, you know, people will watch things they normally would never watch. For instance, if, I, if the Olympics is on, I'll watch swimming. I remember when Michael Phelps won all of his gold medals. I mean, it was amazing watching all of those things. Um, I also remember when I was a little kid just watching figure skating because it was on, and I wanted to make sure that my country uh, was able to defeat the Soviet Union in figure skating. I would get all, you know, really intense into figure skating and swimming and all these things that I normally would never watch if I were to come across swimming on ESPN 7 or whatever. Um, you know, I most likely wouldn't sit there and watch it. But if it's the Olympics, then I will. So, because, you know, I'm somewhat patriotic, I guess. Um, it's always great when you watch soccer games to see examples of patriotism, like the World Cup and stuff. You can always see people that are very proud of their nation. Here's some pictures of the um, most recent Winter Olympics. Here you see the flying tomato and... Uh, Paulo Anton Ono and stuff like that. Uh, and I forgot the skier's name, unfortunately, but you know she was off, obviously a pretty big deal back then. Um, you know, of course, back in the '80s, you also had lots of patriotic movies. You know, Top Gun. You have Rambo. You have Rocky. Um, here's some more examples of nationalism in sports. Um, there was one. Uh, there was one water polo match apparently between the Soviet Union and I believe the Hungarians. And the Soviet Union had just crushed a rebellion in Hungary, and so the Hungarian water polo players basically started punching the Soviet players, and there was blood in the water. So, kind of cool stuff. Uh, the Miracle on Ice, when we beat the Soviet Union, that was a really big deal. Showed a lot of patriotism. Here's a bunch of uh, Iraqis excited about their, soccer, about their soccer team going to the World Cup. Um, so there's a lot of really great examples of nationalism. But I guess the question is, why does this matter? Why is this important to world history? And so let's get to that real quick. Um, so like I said really early on in this lecture, um, is that nationalism can unite a nation, okay? Uh, but it also can rip a nation apart. And we see a great example of nationalism being a unifying force for Italy. Um, 
we tend to assume that countries like Italy and Germany, for instance, have been countries forever, but that's really not true. Uh, Italy, for instance, uh, they weren't what we would recognize as, as, as a nation before 1861. They were uh, uh, broken up into several little kingdoms. And so if you look at the map of Italy there, uh, all those colors represent different little kingdoms in Italy. Uh, but Italy eventually unites. And the reason they unite is that they have the elements of nationalism. Okay, if you think about Italy, ask yourself, do they have a shared history? Most definitely. You know, the Romans were centered in Italy. And so the Italians definitely have a, a shared history. You know, if you think about the border of Italy, the borders of Italy, um, you know, that's been considered Italy for a very long time. So they have that shared history. They have that shared territory. They also have a very proud culture. Okay, uh, the Renaissance took place in Italy. Uh, Italian food is very well known. So the Italians have that shared culture. They have that shared history. They have a shared language. They speak Italian, obviously. They have a shared religion. The Catholic Church is centered in Rome, which is in Italy. Okay, so when you look at the elements of nationalism, you can see that Italy has all those elements. And so as a result, we see the Italians, you know, yearning to be unified uh, in 1861, and it does happen. Okay, another great example of a unifying force, uh, nationalism being a unifying force, is German unification. So we see ger that Germany was not a nation um, you know, before 1871, which is kind of weird because our civil war was going from 1861 to 1865, and yet Germany was not, quote-unquote, um, you know, a real nation. Okay, uh, And what we see happening is that Germany w was broken up into all these little itty-bitty pieces. Okay, there's actually 39 separate German states, tiny little kingdoms, all right? And what happens is this one guy named Bismarck, you can see the picture of this guy on the right there who looks like a pretty mean fella. Um, but Otto von Bismarck, he, he, he wants to somehow unite Germany into one mighty nation. And he actually uses war as a way to unify the German people, which is a pretty clever thing when you think about it, because usually when wars start, people are very, very patriotic. And so basically, Bismarck just picks a couple fights uh, with two of his neighbors. Okay, he first goes to war with Austria, which is the uh, empire just to the south of Germany. Okay, uh, in 1866, and by doing this war in 1866, the um, oops, sorry about that. But by doing this war in 1866, you know, he gets some of these German states to unify. Um, and then in 1870, he feels like he needs to um, pick another fight. And so this is almost kind of laughable. But he decides that the country needs to go and invade France real quick um, to finish the unifying kind of plan that he has. And so all the Germans unite. They give France a little bit of a beatdown. Uh, they actually capture Paris in one year. Um, the Franco-Prussian War is done in less than a year. Um, you know, the Germans embarrass the French, but ultimately the most important thing is that the Germans are able to unite um, because of war. So this is kind of an interesting way of doing it. And in this country, we kind of see the same thing, you know. Uh, right after 9-11, George Bush had an approval rating of around 92%, okay. So when Americans get patriotic, I mean, Americans unite, all right, and then we act as one. And, you know, that is shown very clearly in Bush's approval ratings after 9-11. 92% of the people, uh, you know, were big fans of George W. Bush. Uh, however, you know, once those feelings of nationalism and patriotism kind of subsided, you know, um, after, you know, several years of, you know, love life, I guess, um, Bush's approval rating was at 15% at the end of his presidency. So it's a great example of kind of the effect that nationalism can have on people. All right. Uh, now, like I said, Nationalism can be a good thing, but nationalism can also be a really, really bad thing. All right, uh, the Austria-Hungarian Empire was ripped apart uh, by nationalism. Austria-Hungarian Empire, if you look at this map down here, um, you know each one of these colors represents a separate ethnic group. And so within Austria-Hungary, you had Croats, Serbs, uh, Czechs, Slavics, Poles, Slovenes, Ukrainians, Germans, Magyars, Romanians, Italians. You had all these different types of people, okay? And when you think about it, do they have the five elements of nationalism? Okay, do they have a shared language? No, they do not. Do they have a shared history? No, they do not. Do they have a, a shared culture? No, they do not. They have a shared homeland? No, they do not. Okay, and the Austro-Hungarians, they, they didn't have 
those elements of nationalism. And so what we see happening is that all these ethnic groups within Austria-Hungary, they don't want to be part of Austria-Hungary. They, they want to break away and, and control their own destiny and control their own government. And so we see a lot of uh, you know, strife and conflict within the Austria-Hungarian Empire. They have a very hard time holding uh, their empire together. And what eventually happens is down here, um, Well, pen's not working here. Uh, what we see happening down in Serbia is, is that uh, there's a bunch of people that really hate the Austria-Hungarians. -Hungar and they eventually, at, at some point in 1914, uh, they actually go and kill uh, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, um, which basically starts World War I. All right, another great example of, a, of an empire that is you know, very ethnically diverse um, is the Ottoman Empire. Okay, the Ottoman Empire is full of Turks, Greeks, Albanians, Romanians, Bulgarians, Arabs, Serbs, and Egyptians. All right, once again, go through the elements of nationalism. Do they have what it takes to be united? Do they have a shared language? No, they do not. You know, Greeks speak Greeks, Turks speak, I don't know, Turkish, who knows? Egyptians speak Egyptian, who knows? Um, do they have a shared religion? You know, the Greeks are Orthodox, the Turks are Muslim, so are the Egyptians, the Romanians are something else. I mean, uh, I mean, they have all these different religions within there as well. All right? Shared history? Clearly not. And as a result, the Ottoman Empire slowly over time gets ripped apart. Okay? People start rebelling against them. The Greeks become independent. Um, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, I mean, all these countries, Macedonia, uh, they seek independence and they, they get independence from, from the Ottoman Empire. All right? Um, so I guess the question is, when you look at this country, how is it that we are united? You know, how is it that the United States has not been torn apart by nationalism? You know, you, you look at the map here, and the map represents uh, the major ethnic groups, um, you know, in each state. Okay, and so you see there's a lot of, there's a lot of states that are very German, and the, the red states represent uh, people that don't remember what they are, apparently. There's American. Uh, the orange is Mexican-Americans, the green is Irish-Americans, light blue African-Americans, purple Italian-Americans, dark purple English-Americans, and then yellow Japanese-Americans, all right? So you look at this country, and we are very ethnically diverse. And so I guess the question is, how did we turn out to be a success, whereas some of these other countries, like the Austria-Hungarians and the Ottoman Empire, ripped apart by it? And I think the answer lies in a word called assimilation, all right? Uh, the, the fact is that when Americans came to America, uh, they usually let some of their, or not some, they let most of their old world traditions go. And they decided to kind of just adopt the American way of life and hold on to a couple things, um, you know, from their, from their ancestry. Okay. And so, you know, Milwaukee is a great example. Milwaukee used to be a, gr a great big immigrant city. Okay. Uh, in 1900, the most common language in Milwaukee was German. All right. And the Germans eventually assimilate. I mean, you don't hear people speaking German anymore, do you? Uh, you hear people speaking English, all right? Uh, but if you look at Milwaukee and Wisconsin, we do have a very strong German influence. You know, we eat bratwurst. At, at our, you know, our, our baseball team is called the Brewers. You know, basically, our, our, I mean, our first mascot for the Brewers was a keg of beer with keg man, all right? Um, you know, so we were definitely very strongly influenced by the, by the German people. You know, and the racing sausages are a great example of the ethnic diversity that exists in southeastern Wisconsin. You know, you have, the, you have the, the German bratwurst, you have the Italian sausage, you have the American hot dog, the Polish sausage, and you know, you, now you have the new immigrant group that has come to southeastern Wisconsin. You have, the, uh, you have the Latinos, and you have the chorizo, and I know I didn't roll my H right there. Um, you have the chorizo. And, uh, you know, it's a great example, again, of, you know, another people coming to this state, this country. Um, and while it seems like um, people don't assimilate fast enough, um, you know, the Latinos are assimilating into, a, into American culture just like the Germans and the Irish people did. So, anyways, that's why I think that this country has not been torn apart. It's because we all kind of assimilate and adapt American culture, American way of life.